Hello, everyone. My name is Kurt Young, a leading member of Social Action, and I will be the host for these proceedings. Yesterday, we ran into some unforeseen technical issues forcing us to reschedule this event for tonight. <coughs> Welcome to another in the series of Socialist Action webcasts, now going twice a week, usually on Sunday and Thursday evenings. We are altering the format of our program today to interview our special guest, Jeff Mackler, the Socialist Action candidate for President of the United States. Jeff Mackler is a lifelong anti-war, civil rights, and union activist speaking to us now from Oakland, California. Later, I'll be joined by Yvonne Hansen, an essay comment and former NDP candidate for parliament in Vancouver, who will be posing questions of our own. Please say hi to our audience, Yvonne. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yvonne. I'm coming to you from Vancouver. Um, doing some work with Socialist Action. I, as <laughs> Kurt mentioned, ran as a candidate in Vancouver Granville um, this past federal election. And I'm looking forward to interviewing another federal election candidate uh, in a different country. Thank you, Yvonne. We also will be welcoming <laughs> questions from our audience and we will do our best to answer them all. Folks can type their queries into the chat, call them on screen. If you like this webcast, please subscribe to Socialist Action YouTube channel. If you agree with what you hear, please join Socialist Action by signing up for our <coughs> website, www.socialistaction.ca. And now let's begin. Jeff, could you please tell us a bit about yourself? Well, I live in Oakland, California, and I'm currently the national secretary of the political party called Socialist Action. That's the sister party in the United States of Socialist Action Canada. I am currently the director of the mobilization to free Mumia Abu Jamal. I was the founder and uh, steering committee member of the Northern California Climate Mobilization. I'm on the National Administrative Committee of UNAC, the United National Anti-War Coalition, and I am running for President of the United States against a man called uh, Donald Trump. All right, so thank you for uh, introducing yourself. We'll get right into the questions. So the, our first question for today is, um, as you know, Bernie Sanders, a self-proclaimed socialist, is already or was running in the race for the president of the United States. Is it necessary to have multiple socialists running for president? And why did you choose to run for president? Well, first of all, Bernie Sanders calls himself a democratic socialist. That's in the European tradition, whereby so-called Democratic socialists support capitalism, capitalist wars, affiliation with NATO, and the private ownership for profit of the major means of production. Bernie Sanders is in that category. He's never been in the category of an independent and revolutionary socialist um, uh, person. Bernie has uh, proclaimed that he's in the tradition of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He says under his administration, there will be billionaires. He has a climate uh, policy, a Green New Deal, which leaves intact the major polluting oil corporations in America. He has no concept that a real socialist society can only be brought into being by the massive, collective, united action of the vast majority of the American people not by the decrees or promises of an individual who operates and has done so in his entire during his entire career in the framework of a capitalist party like the Democrats. So Bernie Sanders is not a socialist in any sense of the term. He is a person who believes that he can reform capitalism and reform it in the framework of capitalism's uh, major party, the Democrats or the Republicans. Okay, so to go further on that, uh, the communist in, in the U.S. today is promoted by the so-called progressive media is that people must vote for the lesser of two evils. Many progressives claim that the Democratic Party is less of an existential threat than the Republican Party. 
But what do you see if we look at the record of the previous president of the United States? Barack Obama, a Democrat, made the Bush tax cuts permanent, increased U.S. wars from two to seven, expanded the U.S. drone program, an act of terrorism in which 90% of the victims are civilians, evicted 5 million families from their homes, prosecuted whistleblowers under the Espionage Act, promoted <coughs> drinking, which has led to, the uh, led to the destruction of the drinking water of millions of Americans, created detention facilities at the southern border to intern Hispanic people, and openly established a policy of extrajudicial murder of U.S. citizens. How are these policies any different from those of the Republican Party? Well, Kurt, that reminds me of the old saying, aside from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like to play? And that is what you're saying, in effect, is that there's no difference. You introduced me as a lifelong socialist. Tomorrow, I will be 80 years old. So I have experienced Democrats and Republicans for my entire adult life. It was the Franklin Roosevelt administration and the Truman administration and the Johnson administration and all of the other administrations that got us into one war after another. Bernie Sanders, for example, is fond of saying that we made a mistake in the Vietnam War, but he doesn't mention what that mistake is, although he criticizes his former opponent Joseph Biden for making that mistake. And we made a mistake, says Bernie Sanders, with regard to the Iraq War. But what was the mistake? In truth, the Vietnam War was a holocaust, a genocidal war that took the lives of four million Vietnamese, mostly civilians, that destroyed the infrastructure of that country, that used poison gas, including napalm, defoliated the forests, and destroy the infrastructure of that country. That was the nature of the mistake. And the same with the 2003 Iraq war that Bernie and Joe Biden say were mistakes. That war took the lives of 1.5 million people, as did the support of the United States government under the Somoza dictatorship in Nicaragua. 80,000 people were killed by that U.S. ally, and the Batista dictatorship in Cuba, who wantonly slaughtered all oppositionists. So the truth is that the policies of the Democrats and Republicans are, as your question implies, virtually identical. For example, President Obama conducted seven wars, the largest number in the modern era, as you say, ranging from the destruction of the infrastructure of of Libya, the destruction of Syria. All of these nations in the Middle East were the target of the United States because the United States is interested in oil in those countries. The United States supported the fascist leadership of the Ukraine that came to power with a military coup backed by the United States. What was the United States' interest? In that war, Obama's war, George Bush's war, it was to frack the Ukraine, which has the fifth largest shale oil resources in the world. The United States wanted to simply take over, colonial style, the eastern Ukraine, frack it, and cut off the Russian supply pipes, supply lines to Western Europe in order to be replaced by American. Uh, pipelines. So in my lifetime, the most of the wars were conducted by Democrats. It was President Johnson, Lyndon, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who, for example, promised no American boys would fight in Vietnam. And yet we lost 57,000 American boys fighting in a war that everybody now says was a mistake. If you look at the statistics, the United States became number one in the world in the production of fossil fuels under the Obama administration. And today we have a situation where the very fuel that threatens the destruction of civilization through catastrophic climate change is now not only at peak, but they are producing more oil that can be stored. 
the price of oil in many instances is now negative. That is, the oil corporations have to pay those who store the oil in order to do, in order to not stop production altogether. The price of oil is down to the lowest in the modern era, and yet fracking continues, and yet the use of fossil fuels pushed forward by the Obama administration, as well as Trump, continues without apply on the with, with abandon on the prison industrial complex the united states under democrats and republicans whether it be clinton or obama especially imprisons the highest number and percentage of people in jails in the world the vast majority being black and latino and native american so there is no fundamental policy questions. Obama bailed out the corporations in the 2008 crisis to the tune of a trillion dollars and continued priming the pump with his quantitative easing, that is free money at 0% interest rates to the corporations who turned around and invested it in the casino capitalism stock market and made themselves multi-millionaires and billionaires. It's the same policy with Donald Trump. Both policies voted for his recent $2.3 trillion bailout, the vast majority of which went to the ruling rich. So there is no difference. Lesser evilism is a choice between the twin destructive evils of capitalism. Lesser evilism today means more fossil fuel catastrophes stemming uh, leading, leading to catastrophic global warming, endless production of nuclear weapons, and incapacity to deal with the present coro uh, co um, coronavirus pandemic that is killing in the United States literally 2,000 people every day. Great answers, and uh, I appreciate the fact that you mentioned something that uh, <clears throat> that uh, has been stated over time and time again is that the Republicans uh, pose an existential threat because they deny climate change. While you, as you've noted, that Barack Obama increased the United States uh, oil production to the highest limits that we've ever seen in uh, United States history. So I'll move on to our next uh, question. Uh, the United States government has handled the COVID-19 crisis. The U.S. is expected to have the largest death toll in the world, despite having only one third of the population of China. However, there is some good arising from the crisis. Millions of American Americans in traditional, low-wage, and non-unionized jobs are organizing strikes and walkouts to man PPE and to draw attention to the fact that the poorest Americans make up the largest proportion of the casualties of the crisis. How can we as socialists build upon this groundswell? And what does this crisis say about the capitalist system in American society? Great question, Kurt. First, I should mention that the protests we've seen today are extremely modest. That is, workers are extremely reluctant, all people are extremely reluctant to take to the streets when the coronavirus has killed 47,000 people as I speak at a rate of 2,000 per day, and almost 900,000 are afflicted. But I think you're right. When this crisis subsides a bit and people are able to go into the streets, we're going to see amazing things. But let's take a look at that proposition for a second. Every scientist literally says that when the time comes that we can return to the streets, the result will be a second wave, if not more intense, more deadly than the first. And that is, they have no solutions to the problem other than the president of the United States joined to the hip with the Democrats, speculating on whether or not they can return workers to this deadly environment in may or june or july or august or september that is for them taking the wage slaves out of their homes and putting them to work in american factories where they are the profit 
factor for all American capitalism is primary and not the health and well-being of the population. We have an amazing situation in the United States today. They still don't have, months after this pandemic, the tests available to test to see who has it. The 53 or 47,000 people thereabouts, it changes 2,000 every day, who have already died is just a tip of the iceberg. Tens of thousands of people who have died because of the virus remain unreported. And we still don't know who is afflicted, not just the 900,000 who have tested positive, but perhaps an equal number, some say 80% more, who haven't been tested. And yet, let's take a look at the facts. Number one, a tragedy in itself. 90% of the world's scientists today are engaged in research regarding weaponry, regarding producing weapons of mass destruction, regarding technological breakthroughs in the military, and not in seeking a uh, seeking to find solutions to the current pandemic. And in truth, the pandemic has two factors that must be considered. The first, of course, is the big agriculture encroaches on the world's ecosystems and brings human beings in increasing contact with animals who carry this virus, who otherwise would have been separate and isolated in their own ecosystems. So part of the reason for these ever increasing new deadly diseases, whether it be Ebola or H1N1 or swine flu and now COVID-19, in all of these instances, there's a direct relationship between the destruction of the ecosystem, large-scale farming, destruction of the rainforests and forests in general, and the emergence of these diseases. The second factor, of course, is the incapacity to focus scientific research to solve human needs rather than military destruction. Not to mention the fact that science in the United States takes place in the context of a profit system, where it is simply not profitable for the big pharmaceutical companies or universities or whatever to make their discoveries, breakthrough discoveries, immediately known to the scientific world. Because they first have to ensure that they have a patent and that they can sell their drugs at incredible profits. The same thing with the medical industry. We in the United States are one of the few major nations on earth that does not have a system of health care for all, of free health care, so-called socialist socialized medicine. And it's the same thing with scientific research. We cherish the so-called intellectual property rights of the corporation so they can profit on the research that they're paid to do rather than have it serve the interests of all humanity. So COVID-19 is taking a great toll on the world today with millions afflicted and hundreds of thousands have already died. In the United States, they can't figure out how many that will be. We're approaching 50,000 and in the months ahead at the current rate, which has not subsided, we will have 100,000 dead, perhaps 200,000 dead, and perhaps, perhaps with the second wave, up to a million, if not two million people. The more we learn, the more we know that we're undercounting the dead, we're undercounting those who've contracted the disease, and we have literally few, if any, medical facilities available to them. This is a deadly pandemic. As an older person, I can tell you that st the statistics are amazing. 65 people 65 or older die at a rate of 80% when they're afflicted with this pandemic. And there are an awful lot of people over 65 in the United States. So there is no coordination of scientific research. It's still for profit. There is no massive testing. 
and we have an insane government, and I use the word seriously, that is contemplating sending people back to work in the context of the most awful pandemic the world has witnessed in the modern era. All right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we're now going to go to our uh, comrade, Yvonne Hansen in Vancouver, and <coughs> uh, some of her own questions to you. Hi, Yvonne. Hi, Jeff. Um, so I ran as a anti-capitalist uh, candidate in a very pro-capitalist party. Um, so I'm really curious about what it's like for you running as an anti-capitalist candidate in an anti-capitalist party. And I bet you there's a lot of things that are really similar about how our campaigns had to be run. And I'm sure there's a lot of things that are different as well. Um, so most of my questions are for you in terms of what it's like to run your campaign. Uh, the first question, um, so what are some key areas where a network of activists acting together um, through kind of non-hierarchical unison could help you the most? Well, first, there are big differences between the United States and Canada, but there's one, um, there's one advantage that Canadians have. You have something resembling a mass workers party, the NDP, where you are a candidate. There is no such party in the United States where working people can run and challenge the pro-capitalist leadership of these largely working class parties with bases in the unions uh, to fight. In the United States, our main activity is not the elections an average of $8 billion for the past several years has been spent in elections. Our campaign spends literally a handful, a few thousand dollars. We're excluded from the media. We're excluded from virtually every mass communication method. So our focus up until this virus was to be in the streets as you say, building the social movements. Socialist action plays a leading role in the struggle against U.S. intervention worldwide. We're fighting to close 1,100 U.S. military bases around the world. We want to take the trillion-dollar U.S. military budget and eliminate it and spend it on human needs, desperate human needs, on health care, on the environment, not to mention the trillions that are required to provide a decent standard of living. We're activists in the climate movement, in the civil liberties movement. We're defenders of the whistleblower WikiLeaks leader, Julian Assange, who the United States wants to export for 178 years in prison under the uh, uh, law passed a hundred years ago that no one has ever been imprisoned under. We want to defend civil liberties in the United States, defend women's rights, fight for the liberation of oppressed people, blacks and Latinos. We're important leaders of the struggle to free all political prisoners, especially Mumia Abu-Jamal, Leonard Peltier, and others. So the short answer to your question is, the social movements are our central focus to the extent that we can help coordinate, work with others in united front actions to bring people into the streets to feel their power independent of and against the two capitalist parties. We will make new friends, build our party socialist action, collaborate with our sister party in Canada, socialist action uh, in Canada. So our strength, our focus is the social movements. We simply use the elections because it is a time when increased numbers of people are looking for political solutions and are open to socialist ideas. Today, the polls show that a majority of youth under 30 favor socialism over capitalism, even though they have a vague definition of what that means. And in fact, it's now majority of youth under 40 favor socialism. That's because their experience with capitalism in everyday life means massive student debt, incapacity to get a decent paying job, being support, subjected to jobs that pay uh, 
little or nothing gig economy jobs um, that are count that allow the government to count people as unemployed. So our future is with the people in their struggles in everyday life. I can't hear you. Sorry, Yvonne, you're I'm muted. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Start again. Um, I was saying I could almost hear I could almost hear Barry out there cringing when you said uh, the NDP is a workers' party. But um, anyway, um, so we had a lot of really frustrating yeah. points. Um, all of the NDP candidates that we had to just kind of repeat because this um, past election we did have a really strong environmentalist platform, a really strong um, kind of socially grounded platform. And we had a lot of points that we had to repeat at nauseum, and it was incredibly annoying and incredibly frustrating saying the same things over and over and over. I'm wondering what points have you had to repeat ad nauseum throughout the entire campaign that you just wish everybody could understand already and move on? <clears throat> well, what you're really saying is that in a day when the capitalist media have virtual total control of all the, of all of the means of communication. It's difficult for socialists. One of the things we've had to explain to people, and I wrote an article in our newspaper, which we published jointly with Socialist Action in Canada, the demise of Bernie Sanders, is that Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. a lifelong supporter of the Democratic Party, a member of the Democratic Party National Caucus, and a person who has voted 95% of the time with the Democratic Party is not a socialist. Bernie, in fact, is the appointed, or was, I should say, sheep herder for the unwary into the Democratic Party, and that his job was to take the disillusioned people with capitalist politics and try to create the illusion that they could get a better deal if the so-called left wing of the Democratic Party prevailed. So we had to repeat, as you say, ad nauseum, that the Bernie Sanders of the world, they have been preceded by all kinds of previous sheep herders for the Democratic Party, whether it be Al Gore, the so-called environmentalist, or Jesse Jackson, <clears throat> or others who tell us that we can reform the rapacious system that has brought us to this terrible point. So that's the first thing. The same thing holds with all policies. We have to fight to insist on the facts that the climate catastrophe brought on by the ever-increasing use of fossil fuels threatens life on Earth. People don't seem to understand it because it appears to be distant. And distant is literally weeks, if not years, ahead as new climate catastrophes plague the planet Earth. It's the same thing with imperialist wars. The United States is expert on how to conduct these wars. They do it surreptitiously, so to speak. They use special operations wars, privatized army wars, death squad wars, drone wars, sanction wars, all against poor people around the world. And at the same time, they conduct seven real wars where their weapons of mass destruction are put to full use against largely civilian populations. So we have a tough fight ahead. And the only way we're going to win that fight is to be in the streets, to work with others, United Front style, to have people fight for their own class interests, for a quality air to breathe, for health care, against ongoing imperialist wars, against the pandemics that are inherent in the functioning of the system against the destruction of the environment itself. We live in catastrophic times and socialists are getting a hearing. As frustrating as it is, the polls that I cite with a majority of young people today, and now that young people is expanded to people under 40 years old or on almost under 50, 45% see socialism as a realistic alternative because of their experience. So in other words, I'm not pessimistic. And on the NDP, I wish we had an NDP in the United States. We have a decrepit trade union movement led by 
the AFL-CIO president, Richard Trumka, who's never worked in a mine. He was a former mine union official in his life, in his attorney. And he said he was going to meet with President Trump, who calls together the ruling rich to decide what they're going to do these days. Yes, I think that your national secretary, or federal secretary, Barry, Shep, Barry uh, Weisletter, is right. The NDP is a workers' party with a capitalist program. It seeks to reform capitalism. It supports capitalist parties. But that's why our comrades in Canada are in it, to fight against the bureaucrats who run that party in the interests of the rich, to make it into a live, functioning, daily aspect of the working class to fight for their interests. So I admire your comrades for doing that. I admire you, Yvonne, for being a candidate. I understand that you got some 15% of the vote, which is quite impressive for a revolutionary socialist. Right on. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. Much appreciated. Um, <clears throat> so my next question is actually going to be pretty similar. I think you've already kind of answered it, so I might change it up a little bit. Um, I did just want to say that, yeah, the um, bit about climate change and the urgency of it, that was definitely, definitely one of the pieces that came up over and over and over. And of course, the how do you pay for it um, question, which I'm sure every socialist out there just loves answering, um, dripping with sarcasm here. But yeah, I do. Um, I, I, I wish that one day we have an NDP that is really unapologetic about being a workers party and not trying to be something that it's not. Without further ado, um, my next question, what are some of the key avenues where most of your support has come from? Um, you did mention that you've gotten a lot of support from movements out in the streets. That's amazing. Maybe I could reframe this question and ask, what are some of the most unexpected avenues um, where your support has come from? <clears throat> well, first, the most expected is from young people. And that's because capitalism doesn't offer them a fair deal. And that's been revealed just in the last five weeks, where almost actually 26 million people have filed for unemployment insurance. That tells us that the real unemployment rate, which the government claimed five weeks ago, at 3.5% was a fraud. But we knew it was a fraud before the pandemic. And that is the government statistic called the labor participation rate, showed that 35% of the American people before the virus did not participate. That is, of the eligible working class people did not participate in the economy. That's a hell of a difference from 3.5%. Now, with 30 million, approaching 30 million workers losing their jobs, the actual unemployment rate of the United States is not the 10 or even 20 or 30 percent projected, but it's a majority of working people who work at low wage jobs with no security, often with no medical benefits, and often only part time. And when they do have so called full time jobs, they're gig jobs where they work a few hours or days and therefore are counted in the statistics. This coronavirus has torn off the veil of stability in the United States. And that's the reason why socialist action is getting a hearing from young people. And I fully expect we'll get a greater hearing. Just think of the absurdity. We have millions, literally millions of workers today working in warehouses that are not protected with no masks, while 11 such warehouses have already had reported cases of the coronavirus. And the government and the basic Amazon and other industries that run these warehouses, which account for a majority of the sales of the, the basic commodities of the United States today, they're in these factories. There's no protection. Really a mask, nothing to cleanse your hands with. And workers are angry at that. A handful. A large number in some places are protesting and demanding special pay to work under deadly conditions. Overtime, 
provisions for uh, sick leave, none of which existed before. And who are these warehouse workers? In the Midwest and in the main five centers where they operate, they are young people, often college students, non-union, no benefits whatsoever. They're going to come out of this virus crisis when it ebbs, angrier than ever, as are the students and the debts. What about the $1,200 that the government promised in its first $2.3 trillion bailout? We have found, unbelievably, that the banks included in this provision their right to deduct debts off the $1,200 per person who is eligible. So some people have been told that the $1,200 doesn't exist because they're overdrawn from their accounts. And the government has another provision in its new law saying that it can deduct from the United States government's available funds overdrafts by a certain percentage. One infamous Minneapolis banker literally named his yacht the overdraft. That is, a multi-millionaire, multi-billionaire runs around sailing a luxury yacht and names it after his legalized stealing from the American people. And the same thing that goes for the so-called $345 billion granted to small businesses. It turns out that the legislation includes the right of the largest banks in America, like J.P. Morgan Chase, to decide without consultation which of these so-called, and I say so-called, small corporations, which are defined as 500 workers or less, gets the money. So they can call up the big uh, food distribution centers, the big, uh, you know, Victoria's Secret type uh, governments, the big food chains, and say, well, how much do you want? And the bank writes them a check on the government's money. Whereas working people have overwhelmingly gotten nothing that is small shop owners. And the result was that Congress, under pressure, had to allocate another 300 to 400 billion dollars just yesterday. Thursday, in order to try to get some of the money to working people. So even the bailout bills have been largely administered by and the funds given to the giant corporations, the failing airline corporations, the Boeing corporations that produced jetliners that killed, that crashed and killed literally hundreds of people. The rich get richer in the United States, and that's the concern of these multi-trillion dollar bailouts. Working people need our own party. Working people understand now more than any time in the modern era that there's something fundamentally wrong with a system where half the population is not working, and many of those who are working are working for minimum wage or low wage jobs that they that can't afford rent. A week into this virus, they literally had a stunning statistic. One third of American households who rent couldn't afford to pay rent. And that is that one third, as a minimum, literally live hand to mouth. The wage slaves come into this world, that is the working class with nothing, and after working a lifetime for their capitalist bosses, they leave with nothing. They live one week or two away from poverty. The food lines are unprecedented in the United States, and yet millions of tons of pork and chickens and eggs are dumped into ditches because they can't be sold profitably. Profit is king in the United States, not human needs. So. In answer to your question, Yvonne, our audience is bigger than it has been in a long time. It's radicalizing young people 
who are beginning to understand that they are not the fault, that they didn't go to school long enough, they didn't save their money, they made poor choices, but rather they have everything in common with their entire generation that is being ripped off to a degree never seen in the modern era. Okay, so um, Yvonne has, I believe, two more questions, but uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, running out of time. You've already answered several parts of question that I really <coughs> wanted to ask, so I won't, uh, I'll be only asking one question, but I'd like if, uh, uh, Jeff, if you would uh, just shorten your answers for the next two questions of, for Yvonne so that we can get to the questions of our uh, audience members as soon as possible. Thank you. So actually, in the interest of time, um, my last question is sort of a repeat of one that Kurt asked earlier. So it was going to be why president, but you did already answer that. So my last question will be my fourth question. Um, which aspects of your campaign are you most excited about? Well, uh, first, Right before the campaign, I did an East Coast tour, and I covered Maine, New York City, Norfolk, Virginia, Lexington, Kentucky, and I found an increased receptivity on the part of young people especially, who attended our forums and meetings and who uh, were interested in joining. That's the most interesting. The second is where we are today. The fact that I can literally talk to you and to Kurt, and have our remarks broadcast, not just in our newspaper, which is printed, but to thousands of people. Yesterday, 2,000 people, I should say Sunday, listened to us talk about the Civil Liberties Battle of Julian Assange. So we are mastering the art which you are refining of communication, and that gives us greater access to working people than we've had in a long time. Okay, so I'm going to ask my last question. Um, so in January of 2019, former Deputy Assistant Director of the FBI, Terry Turchi, admitted on Fox News that when he started decades ago in the FBI, one of its missions was to ensure that progressives and socialists did not obtain, ele obtain elected office within the U.S. The program became well known under the acronym COINTELPRO. There's very little reason to believe that the FBI has given up on these activities. Could you tell us what obstacles you have faced as a socialist in America and what obstacles you expect to face in your election campaign? Good question, Kurt. First, the access of socialists to the American electoral system is practically zero. Let me give you an example. In 2006, I ran for the U.S. Senate when a new law was passed allowing everyone to be in the primary. When I filed the adequate number of petitions to be a primary contested for U.S. Senate, all parties that were the ruling class parties were listed. Joe Smith, Democrat, you know, Susan Jones, Republican, etc. And with me, they said Jeff Mackler, Declined to state. I didn't decline to state. I said I was the National Secretary of Socialist Action. They said, sorry, the laws prohibit that. So I went to court naively and challenged that. And at the end of this first court proceeding, the Republican Party intervened to say, well, they submitted a brief on behalf of the state's position, excluding the right of socialists to have their name listed. And the judge granted them $242,000 in legal fees that they imposed against me and the two or three people who joined me in the lawsuit. In past years, we have submitted 500,000 signatures to qualify for the ballot, which required 250,000 for the presidency in the United States, and we are ruled off the ballot. These kind of restrictive ballot laws overseen by the Democrats and Republicans in county uh, election boards are the norm everywhere. It is virtually impossible to get on the ballot as any candidate who is 
not a Democrat or Republican finds out. Then there's the added problem of the major media use the fact that you're not ballot certified, that you couldn't collect 100, 200, 1,000, 300, or 400,000 signatures to refuse to cover any aspects of your campaign. But that too has been the norm. So getting on the ballot, access to the ballot, is extremely difficult. We run mostly educational campaigns where we take our campaign to the streets, to the giant social movements, to the struggle of workers on strike, to the struggle of women for abortion rights, to the struggles against the environment. That's where the people are mobilized. That's where the great bulk of our new recruits come from. Not because we have any illusion that the capitalist parties and the capitalist kept media are going to give us a fair shake. I will say one humorous thing to close. I did get a couple of interviews, one from Vice Media and another from the Atlantic Monthly. They were mainline publications that go to millions. And they interviewed me to say, Jeff Mackler, you're running as a socialist. How do you differ from Bernie Sanders? And I would tell them, I'm for 100% cut of the military budget. I am for nationalization of the healthcare industry. Bernie Sanders is not. And basically, the reporter made the point, you see, don't worry about Bernie Sanders. He's not a real socialist. If you want someone who is going to terrorize you, like nationalizing the fossil fuel industry, like stopping climate catastrophe, like ending racism, you, you, uh, if you vote for Jeff Mackler, you're going to get that. Well, that was the last of my two interviews because after they broadcast those interviews, a flock of people decided to join our party because that's precisely the kind of socialism they're interested in. So yes, we have a hard time with ballot access. We have a hard time getting our ideas out there. But to the very extent that our ideas are relevant to the day-to-day -day needs of working people, we will get a hearing. And thanks. Right, thank you for that. And I'm hoping that uh, you know the obstacles you're facing, the lack of media coverage is lessened to an extent. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be asking several questions from the chat and so will Yvonne, uh, but I actually want to draw attention to one of the people in the chat, a man by the name of Max Irwin. And this is something that I feel we have to just uh, let our audience know for, uh, you know, the fact that uh, there are people like that who need uh, our attention. And Max Irwin says, by the way, I'm one of those going broke because of loss of job and not getting my food stamps or unemployment. I am scared, says S. List. I will be homeless soon. I was a cabbie and now I have no income at all and a few hundred bucks left and three months late on rent. So, you know, you know, and so I, I made some poor choices, but I worked most of my life and I have nothing to show uh, for it. So. He's one of the people that we're fighting for, you know, so uh, I just wanted to, you know, let him know that we are fighting for you. We hope that, you know, reach out to community networks. And uh, we, that's one of the things we need to do is build community networks to help every single person uh, within our country, because uh, so many are being not left behind, actively destroyed by this capitalist system. So I'm just going to go over to a couple questions. I'm going to start with Ellen Ramsey asks, and Jeff, could you uh, just jot these down? Do you think that climate change policies will be jettisoned by the current health crisis? What is the future for eco-socialism? And then uh, Barry Wiseletter asks, uh, when you are elected president, Jeff, what will you say to Justin Trudeau about pipelines, the continental trade deal, and regime change intervention aimed at Venezuela, Cuba, and other countries? And then uh, Jeremy C, or I believe it's Jeremy C, asks, I know identity politics may turn moderates off, but it's useful idealism. I'm young. I just hate to say my LGBTQ friends oppressed and it's hard not to let that take precedence over all other problems. So uh, 
just share your opinions on those statements and uh, those questions. <clears throat> well, they are all world-class questions. On the first, the President of the United States, with support from many governors, is saying to, like, the governor of New York State, Andrew Cuomo, uh, if you have no money, rather than asking the federal government, why don't you simply declare bankruptcy? Well, that sounds like a reasonable thing. If you don't have any money, you can't pay. But what Trump really had in me and mine was once the states begin declaring bankruptcy, they are no longer, they think, liable for paying out the state pensions that millions of workers have accrued for a lifetime. The same thing with the corporations. They say, well, our coal mine went bankrupt. We can't afford to pay mine workers pensions and other state benefits that are mandated. So the idea of jettisoning, jettisoning past gains in the name of a crisis is the number one starting point. We should expect the government of the United States claiming poverty, the employers saying they can't afford to pay the wages, um, and others who are going to be laid off permanently and replaced by robots. We should expect the capitalist class to take it out on the hides of working people. And that in itself will bring back a massive response from working people. On climate change, it's the same thing. First is they haven't jettisoned, they haven't even begun the climate change problem. The United States is producing more oil and fossil fuel, especially uh, fracking uh, natural gas, than any nation on Earth. We are a glut with it. And the result is going to be because the, the price temporarily of fossil fuel has hit historic low, if not close to zero, it will drive the smaller oil corporations out of business and lead to the consolidation of the oil market in the hands of the big oil monopolies who will then use it to increase the price of oil in order, because they have a monopoly on it, in order to extract more from working people. On the second question, <clears throat> the pipelines, pipelines, as you saw with the effort to uh, use pipelines in the areas that have been the historic homeland of indigenous communities, the Wet'suwet'en uh, people, and in the United States, these pipelines are threats to the existence of entire peoples, not to mention the fact that they carry fossil fuels to allow the increased production of them. So we're against the extension of these pipelines. We're for the abolition of these pipelines and a massive crash program to build an eco-socialist society that relies on safe, sustainable energy production by nature's natural fuels, the sun, earth, solar, and, uh, and other such mechanisms. As far as the policies of the United States on Venezuela and Cuba, they are an integral part of what we do. We just finished a battle and won a victory, if not a total victory, when we defended the rights of the Venezuelan embassy defenders in Washington, D.C., who were arrested by the federal government on charges of interfering with government functions. And the government function was the United States literally appointing a president of Venezuela, Juan Guaido, to replace the elected president of that country. Our view is U.S. hands off out now and the sanctions and the embargo and the coups and the death squad attempts on the president of Venezuela, Maduro, and on his life. The United States imposes sanctions that threaten the lives, I'll put it this way, a UN reporter said that 50,000 Venezuelans have died because of the US sanctions. 
not to mention the U.S. coups, the embargo, the refusal to allow medical aid to that country. We are against the embargo of revolutionary Cuba, which has set the example for the entire world on how to deal with the coronavirus. Cuba and Cuba only, to my knowledge, has literally sent thousands, if not tens of thousands of doctors to the most stricken areas in the world, even if those governments are not supportive of Cuban policy. Cuban doctors were in China. Cuban doctors were in Italy and the northern part where the highest concentration of deaths was. And Cuban doctors are throughout the Caribbean, Latin America, because in Cuba, they have not only free health care, the lowest more infant mortality rate, one of the highest life longevity rates in the world, but they have free medical care for all, and they produce a higher ratio of doctors to Cubans than any country on the planet Earth. We say the Cubans are, and their biomedical industry are playing a leading role, especially in proportion to their size, Cuba has 11 million people, in sending vaccines that have the possibility of restricting the severity of the coronavirus. Cubans' medicines have been effective with other viruses. And the United States, the United States not only invaded Cuba, but they infected the banana population with deadly bacterium, they introduced swine flu that killed hundreds of thousands of Cuban pigs and otherwise used bacteriological warfare against the Cuban people in a similar way that the United States did the same in Vietnam. So we stand in solidarity with revolutionary Cuba, which has been exemplary. And finally, um, let's see, I had three questions on identity politics. Socialist action in the United States and Canada are unqualified supporters of the rights of all oppressed people, not only blacks and Latinos and Native Americans and women, but LGBTQI plus people. We offer their full unequivocal right to equal rights with every other person in the population. By identity politics, however, there's a small layer in the population who argue that one of these fights, that is the defense of workers or the defense of blacks or Latinos, takes priority over the defense of others. Our view is we have to build united fronts that defend everyone's fundamental democratic rights. We don't think that anybody has any special standing in this world because of their sexual identity, their racial identity, and so on. We support all struggles of the oppressed for equality and liberation, and don't counterpose one group against the other. Yes, there are people who are specially oppressed, and those are the ones that lead the fights for LGBT rights, black rights, Native American rights, Latino rights. That's why we are an integral part of all of these struggles. But we take exception to those who think that one group should be prioritized over another. We have a blanket support for all of the oppressed, and we have a method of struggle to unite for democratic rights, the struggle of all people who are oppressed under capitalist society. Uh, thank you, Jeff. So we've got a few questions. Um, I will read one from Max Irwin, who Kurt gave a shout out to earlier. Um, there's two questions here. The first is, are these social movements different than identity politics and reformist politics? Um, his second question is, uh, the majority of youth under 30 who favor socialism while not being able to define socialism, um, that's problematic. Max, or he says, um, oh, <laughs> I mean, what they think of is socialism is actually seeming to be Sandersism and really reformism in most cases. So that doesn't give him much hope. Um, just if you could say a few words about that, the confusion of Sandersism with socialism. 
Well, I think increasing numbers of Sanders supporters are coming to believe what we have been arguing all along, and that is that Sanders' function was to sheepherd people back into the Democratic Party. So a recent poll in the New York Times said that 80% of Bernie's supporters are going to support Biden, and 15% are going to be supporting Trump, whereas a smaller percentage, perhaps three or four, are going to be supporting third parties. That includes the Green Party and socialist politics, socialist groups. So Bernie Sanders served his role, and now he and the so-called left wing of the Democratic Party are back in to Biden's camp. But the ruling class of note has questions about Biden's viability. We practically hear no one talking about presidential politics in the United States. The vast majority of the space of the, of the New York Times, for example, probably 80% of the articles has to do or have to do with the coronavirus. And the presidential elections have faded. So I think the ruling class may be looking around for a more viable, positive sounding uh, candidate than Biden. But regardless, whoever they pick, all of these candidates, including those that eventually uh, are chosen at the Democratic Party convention, if it ever takes place in person in July or August, will be wedded to the ruling class. As far as the first question by Max Ir Irwin, of course, my heart goes out to him because he, like millions of others, are living in the poverty that is a product of the functioning of the capitalist system. And he describes being homeless or near homeless as a condition that afflicts literally hundreds of thousands, if not a million people in the United States every night. Do we counterpose one movement against the other? Max says no. We give our full unequivocal support to every struggle that seeks to challenge the inequality that is inherent in the capitalist system, whether it be the struggles of the homeless, or the struggles of the LGBTQI community, including all the, uh, including the, uh, the demonstrations and protests and marches were there. But we do tend to focus on the issues that allow us to maximize the number of people in the streets. We've initiated United Front coalitions that brought 300,000 people into the streets to bring the troops home from the Middle East, imperialist wars that take the lives of millions of people are a still ongoing concern. The majority of the American people are opposed to these wars. We say, eliminate the war budget and solve human needs. So basically we're guided by what is possible. And that is wherever we can mobilize large numbers, we do that. Is it the numbers themselves that are important? No, not at all. But the numbers in the streets have an effect on the consciousness of people. All our lives we're told that we're a tiny minority, that we can't change the system, that we can't fight City Hall, that we're isolated individuals with no alternatives. But when people get into the streets in the tens and hundreds and millions, they begin to understand a new reality, that they are the majority, that the government is the minority, that the government represents the 1%, which is one of the sterling achievements of the Occupy movement, and that that 1% doesn't represent us. In fact, that 1% in the United States, according to even Bernie Sanders, owns an amount of wealth that is equal to a majority of all the people in the United States. One figure put the figure at 80% of the United States. A small handful of billionaires own more wealth than the vast majority. So our view is that mass action has an extremely intense educational experience. It convinces the majority that they are the real majority, that they have the power, 
that they can turn this system off, that they can force it to make concessions, and indeed that when these concessions are not forthcoming, that the validity of the system itself is challenged. That's what socialists want to do. We want to fundamentally end capitalist rule. And we can only do that with the help and support of millions and tens of millions of people in the United States and everywhere else. Join us, support our campaign, and join SA Canada. I'm sure you'll have the information available about how to do so. We also have a common newspaper. Subscribe. Thanks. Um, all right, so we've got a question here from Barry Wiseletter. Um, many DSA members are conflicted, either support Joe Biden and the Wall Street Democratic Party, or support the left liberal Green candidate um, for president. Is there a better alternative in the street? And a second question um, that I have, and if you could answer them both kind of together, um, Michael or Mitchell Shore says, uh, what are some of the first things that you would do once you're elected? Well, to answer the second question first, if we have a situation in the United States where I'm elected president, that would be quite unique. Well, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd close 1,100 military bases around the world and bring our boys home now. I would abolish the war budget in its entirety. I would make education from the cradle to the grave free for everyone. I would establish instantly a free medical system for every single human being on earth. And in order to do that, I would nationalize the entire for-profit, mega-profit, big pharma, big pharmaceutical and medical system. I would fundamentally revamp every aspect of American society. I would end, I would spend billions rebuilding our schools and abolish the inherent racial discrimination and resegregation of the public school system. It would be free to everyone. There would be no homelessness. There would be no hunger, literally, overnight. A socialist society today in the United States is fully capable of producing more food than we need for example, and yet we have people who suffer from homelessness and hunger. In the socialist society we built, almost instantly, because we have the technological scientific capacity, supermarkets would be fundamentally changed. We wouldn't have to lock the doors. There wouldn't be cashiers. There wouldn't be guards. People would go in and take what they wanted. There would be a few fools like myself who would immediately run to the lobster bin to take two or three lobsters, but I would be capable of overcoming that. But the truth is that what I'm saying is not a fantasy. In a society that can produce more food, healthy food, sustainable food, than is needed, we can send food around the world and feed our own people. We can come close to immediately ending homelessness. Like the French did in 1789, I would open the Bastille and free the prisoners, not only the political prisoners, but all the prisoners, two and a half million people who are incarcerated in the United States. And you say, well, there's some dangerous people there, Jeff. What are you going to do with them? Our slogan would be rehabilitation, not incarceration. This is the society that we welcome prisoners into would have quality jobs, would have the best psychological um, rehabilitation services, would have housing, quality education. There would be no need for people to steal and no sickness imposed on people because of the terrible poverty in their condition that leads them to do unsocial acts. In other words, a socialist society is within our reach. It is a society of plenty. It is a society where there need be no hunger, where we need not pollute the air that we breathe, destroy the deserts, wipe out the Amazon rainforest, pollute our waters. 
destroy the species on the planet. All of that would go literally within days and weeks as working people would be put to work at qualitatively better jobs, shorter hours, and the best conditions possible, safe conditions to build a new world. That's within our reach. Socialists pledge to do that. And on the other question, I think I missed that. Um, do you happen to have it handy? Uh, yeah, hang on. Um, very wise letter says, many DSA members are conflicted. Uh, support Joe Biden, uh, Democratic Party, or support the liberal, liberal left um, Green Party candidate. Is there a better alternative in the streets? And I also just wanted to say that was very inspiring. Thank you for kind of um, giving us something to, to imagine. Okay. Uh, the DSA convention that took place several months ago voted by an 80% majority for a resolution called Bernie or Bust. And that is, uh, if Sanders does not become the Democratic Party candidate, they will not support Biden or any other Democrat. That's come to pass. And yet, that's a national resolution, but it doesn't bind the members. DSA is basically a social democratic party that has always supported and run in the Democratic primaries. That includes AOC, Alexandria, Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Ilhan Omar from uh, Minnesota, and all the others. They all run as Democrats, that is, they run as the candidates of the Capitalist Party. And in 2018, in the interim elections, they all supported every Democrat on the ballot, regardless of whether or not they were right-wing racist segregationists or left-wing liberals. So what would I do? I would urge people to join our party, to be a participant in the social struggles that are the only struggles capable of transforming American society. In the streets, united, black, white, Latino, LGBT, environmental activists, our time is coming. Yes, build these individual movements, but out of them will come the leaders who join our revolutionary party and who bring with them the decades, if not centuries, of experience for one proposition. Capitalism cannot solve the problems of humanity. Only a socialist, egalitarian, caring, loving, humanitarian society can do that. So I urge young people who are in the DSA, join us. Join us in the streets. Join us in the United Front coalitions. Support our election campaign. Bring your voice. But most important, get involved. The electoral game is a dead end. It is. It ends on election day. Our game is every day of the week. Every struggle we champion, every struggle we support is a step forward for humankind. And every struggle that we subordinate to knocking on doors for capitalist candidates, for warmongering Democrats, and for their... Uh, policies that fail to address the critical issues of our time, the existential issues, the issues that have to do with the existence, the future existence of humanity, nuclear war, climate crisis, global warming, and now the COVID crisis. These can't be solved in the framework of capitalism. We need to rip it up from the ground floor up, and we need the majority to do that. Join us become a revolutionary in the best sense of the term. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we're going to end up having to wrap this up. I know many in the chat had a lot of questions. Uh, Mirage had a question, but you had uh, answered that when you answered uh, Mitchell's question. Uh, we also have a comrade, uh, Jeremy C., who's uh, concerned that he might be considered a class trader because he's a successful uh, real estate agent in China. But uh, I'd like to assure him that uh, if you're part of the struggle against uh, capitalism, if, even if everybody's got to eat, so if you're successful, uh, I don't hold it against you. But if everybody has to fight against capitalism, and if you're openly fighting against capitalism, then I don't see you as a trader. 
uh, others might want to speak on that. But uh, I'll I'll uh, let you say your last words, uh, Jeff. But uh, if I'm going to pose them in the form of a question by a commenter, a commenter by the name of Sunflower Socialist, who asks, "Where, if anywhere, are you on the ballot?" And does your campaign have a website or a social media presence? So could you please, you know, answer those questions and do your, give us your wrap up, your last words. Okay. Um, first, we'll be on the ballot as write-in candidates, likely in California and New York and other states. We don't have the resources to hire people to get us on the ballot or everywhere else. I don't understand the remark about real estate agents in China. I have nothing to my name other than the house that I got because uh, I was a teacher for 20 years, high school biology, and I bought a house when they were practically giving them away. Um, otherwise, that's my value other than my ideas. I work full time for socialist action. I don't know what you mean by China. In our view, China is a capitalist country. It is a capitalist country that practices imperialist politics. It has some differences in that it competes with the United States on an uneven basis. So some of its policies may appear to be more progressive than the United States, including how they handle the virus in Wuhan, China, where it was the first and it hit hard, but they have one of the lowest mortality rates in the world. Whereas the United States, which stood by idly, has virtually the highest mortality rate in, in the world. The most advanced capitalist country in the world is suffering the most rather than the least. That tells you something about the problems of capitalist society. The society that we do think sets an example, a small one, but an important one, is Cuba. We are supporters of the revolutionary Cuban people and its government. They have been exemplary. They're the only nation on earth in the modern era that's given the land to the people, that has abolished illiteracy almost overnight, that has the highest percentage of doctors to people in the world, and other statistics which make Cuba the envy of the world. Cuba supports every struggle for humanity, and we solidarize with Cuba. As far as closing remarks, all I can say is join us. We're a healthy revolutionary party, as you can see by our two co-hosts. Kurt is a union activist, and Ivan is a political activist. I don't know your occupation, but the fact that you campaigned and went door to door talking to working people in British Columbia is exemplary. These are the kinds of young people that we want to build our party with. We want to have you on these TV shows. We want you to build SA Canada and SA the United States from coast to coast. And now SA Canada is coast to coast from Toronto to Vancouver to cities in between. I believe Kurt is from Missagua. And socialist action is the same with branches and members of some 14 cities across the country. You can contact us at socialistaction.org. That's our website. And you can email us at socialistaction at lmi.net. And we'd be glad to talk to you about joining our party. If you're in Canada, join SA Canada. And I think it's a League for Socialist Action in the French language, which I don't speak. Or you can join SA Socialist Action in the United States. Thank you so much for this wonderful program and opportunity to address you. Thank you, um, Yvonne. Do you have anything to say in our last moments? Just wanted to say again, thank you so much, um, Jeff, for giving us that opportunity to kind of hear your vision of what the future could look like under a socialist government in the United States. I'm sure that's a world that most of the people watching this broadcast would really love to see, um, particularly when you talked about demilitarization, um, immediately ending the military industrial complex. I can't imagine anything but good things coming from that. And I really hope that you or someone like you 
has a chance to make that happen someday in the near future and that I'll get to see it. All right. Thanks again to Yvonne and Jeff Mackler and to everyone who participated in tonight's dialogue. Please consider buying a subscription to Socialist Action Newspaper, only $25 for one year, delivered to your door. Just visit our website at www.socialistaction.ca. And that again is www.socialistaction.ca. That will be down in the description below. If you would like to talk to us about joining Socialist Action, please call 647-986-1917. Again, that's 647-986-1917. Uh, you can also email us at socialistactioncanada at gmail.com. Uh, gmail and that information, again, will be in the description below. And once again, if you like to this, this show, please subscribe to this Socialist Action YouTube channel. The next webcast is on Sunday, April 26th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. The topic is imperialism with social uh, essay political economist Yasin Kaya, Plus discussions Emily in Guelph, Emery in Edmonton, and Jeremiah in Vancouver. There will be a May 1st online rally to mark Workers' Day on Friday, May 1st at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, organized by the Labor Day Make uh, Labor Day uh, Labor May Day Committee, in which SA participates in several organizations. Uh, on Saturday, May 2nd, we will go online with the 34th Annual Socialist Action Cultural and Political Celebration of International Workers' Day. That will be Saturday at 7 p.m. And with a number of speakers and entertainers and chaired by Elizabeth Spice. Uh, we usually do this in person, but due to the issues with COVID, obviously we're going online. And thank you for joining us tonight. Be safe, be healthy, and stay active. Bye for now.